uh, Rector uh, G. Lee, Vice Rector Montanaro, uh, Professor Johnny Gione, and Professor Corinto, distinguished guests, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen, and friends. It's a great pleasure and real honor uh, for me to have this opportunity uh, with this event of a honoris causa. I want to thank the organizing committee and especially the rector Gilly and Professor Corinto who had uh, gone through all the necessary steps to get this distinguished award, which I am most grateful. Let me now talk about um, my short talk today. And uh, in the, here is a picture that all of you recognize. Uh, at the beginning of the 2000th century, uh, Hawking was asked to predict the next century. And he said, I think the next century will be the century of complexity. So this is what my talk is. What is complexity? If it's so, so important, what is complexity? Well, you will see shortly that it's actually not that simple. And in fact, to understand what is complexity, it is easier to first out find out what is not complexity. And uh, I have here a little cartoon that will give you as an essence. Uh, typically, when we talk about complexity, we talk about a collection of identical, very simple, identical cells or units or uh, agents or whatever that should be very simple individuals and should be uh, identical and they are sort of interacting in the same way. So, 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 so in general, one would, would not expect anything interesting because first of all, it's so simple and they are all identical, so what do you expect? And, uh, but turns out that things interesting could happen, but here's an example of what is actually not complexity. And uh, just imagine a, a group of sleepy students in the morning, uh, and the professor just walk in with a cup of cappuccino, and the coffee molecules, these are the units now, the coffee and the students, uh, will begin to diffuse. The diffusion is the interaction. And in a few minutes' time, the last person in the class is going to smell the same coffee molecule as this person here. And they will all be awake, of course. But they are all behaving in the same way. The coffee molecules are just uniformly distributed. If you were able to uh, collect a, a one cubic centimeter anywhere in the room and you count the number of coffee molecules, you will find on average they're all identical. So this is an example of what is not complexity because they're, they're homogeneous. This is what you expect. Many things would be, uh, behave the same way if you make some daiquiri uh, or, or any, many of the cocktails, you mix uh, two liquids, eventually in a short period of time it becomes identical, it's homogeneous. This is our common experience. And there's a reason for that, uh, because the evolution toward a homogeneous steady state is in fact the hallmark of the second law of thermodynamics that all of you know. But it turns out that there are many even more exciting things that do not obey the second law of thermodynamics. And I will show you now uh, what it is some examples. We we'll start with a leopard, and if you look un under the, sk the skin and collect, look at all the cells, you will find that they are all identical. So what does a cell here know that it should become black and the navel should become yellow? It's, they're all identical. It's, you know, you have a hom homogeneous medium. The cells are identical, and yet, Somehow, mysteriously, uh, it develops into spots. So unsolved problem is how does a leopard get its spots? 
This remains unsolved until uh, what I will explain today. This is an example of a static pattern, things stationary. But you can something interesting, you can mix a cocktail that I call the uh, Beluzov Zabozinski or BZ uh, cocktail, and you mix up four chemical maloric acid, sulfuric acid, potassium bromate, and ter uh, teroin. And depending on the proportion, you will suddenly see something interesting. For example, you, that glass would start with some red color, and then a few seconds later it becomes blue, and then red again, and then blue, and it will continue exactly at the same period. So we now have a dynamic pattern. This is no longer homogeneous, it keeps changing, and it's dynamic. So you begin to see that this is something very different. It, it's not homogeneous, unlike, unlike the coffee molecules. These are examples of complexity. Nature, in fact, is full of non-homogeneous patterns, which is widely discussed under the seductive topic called complexity. The, the subject complexity, in fact, has attracted uh, the curiosity of many famous scientists and has remained unanswered until recently. Boltzmann, all of you know, in fact, tried to characterize complexity by saying that this has to violate the second law of thermodynamics, therefore the complexity uh, the entropy must decrease. Schrodinger says that what you need is negative entropy, which he coined the word negentropy. 20 years later also, Prigogini uh, said that uh, it, this complexity must involve the instability of the homogeneous. Because when things are homogeneous, I mean, they, all the cells are identical, homogeneous, so do you expect the solution should be, you should expect one solution should be identical. But how come you have something here, you have a pattern? It means that the homogeneous part must become unstable. So he said it had to be the instability. But of course, none of this is the answer. It is the characterization, the manifestation. And the most distinguished, uh, most recent one is Gelman, who is famous, of course, for uh, the quark. And he said that complexity requires the amplification of fluctuations. So these are all manifestations of the concept of complexity. And there are thousands of papers written, hundreds of books written. These are some of them, and written by distinguished authors like Prigozini, Gelman, uh, etc., and they are Schrodinger. Haken, and they come in different titles that are all talking similar thing. For example, self-organization, synergetics. And some years ago, in fact, more than 20 years ago, I began to be uh, a bit uh, very concerned with what, what, what is complexity. And, uh, and I s suddenly realized that there were many topics that I never heard, uh, understood. And it was very intimidating because it looks very deep. Then I realized that there are all kinds of things that I never knew before. It's, among them is word complexity. These were words that were introduced by all these people doing complexity. They're writing books and papers, they use these words. Cooperative phenomena, dissipative structure, emergent phenomena, far from thermodynamic, uh, far from equilibrium phenomena, order from disorder, phase transformation, self-organization, Synergetics, I'm just giving you a, a few lists of that. And then self assembled phenomena, spontaneous phenomena, endogenous phenomena, autopoietic phenomena, autocatakinetic phenomena, autotonous phenomena, and there are more. So you would be intimidated as all well because this seems to be all amazing. And so I asked myself, how would I ever have enough time to learn all of this? So I began to dig into them, and I found most of them have the same examples. So I started to ask the question, what do all of these names have in common? Why do we have so many names? And I was shocked that the answer, what do they have in common, is they have no definitions. That is what they have in common. And people were just looking at phenomena that they do not understand, and therefore they invent new names. But nobody knows exactly what the phenomena is, except they just invent names. 
And uh, to give you an example, a famous book by Gelman, and I will look, uh, uh, who was the inventor of Quark, of course, and on page, on page 99 of his book, I will just quote this one paragraph, five sentences, and you look into there, you will see that the word self-organized, emergent, complex, self-organized, emergent, complex appear in almost every other sentence. And the reason he had to use so many names is because there were no definition. So he was using what I call the art of tautology. Tautology means he is using an undefined term to define another undefined term. That was the state of the art until recently. So to summarize, the current rather sexy research area called complexity, in fact, uh, has no definition, no theory, no foundation. It is just a mixed bag of jargons and anecdotes. So I have to now tell you, I've been complaining that there is no definition, so I will now tell you what should be the definition. And when you make a definition, you should be able to back up with scientific principles. You should be able to prove theorem so that you can say, according to this theorem, this is or is not complex, for example. And it turns out that it is very simple. The th definition of complexity is a homogeneous media, like the coffee molecules or all the identical collections, is said to be to, to exhibit complexity if and only if it admits a non-homogeneous static or dynamic solution. That's very simple. So when you have a collection of identical molecules, identical cells, identical units, or any identical agents, and they, they interact, when is it complex? Well, it is complex when you can show that it has more than one pattern, not just homogeneous. So that is the correct, that is the proper definition of complexity. And I have developed the mathematics behind it so that you can actually test. And it turned out that it is quite simple. So that's the good news. Now, Schrodinger, Prigogini, Eigen, Gelman, Turing, Smell, etc., they all thought about it. But unfortunately, they don't have a definition, but they all realize that there is a missing new physical principle that will be needed to explain all of these uh, uh, funny names that the people introduce. And I will tell you today that the missing physical principle is called local activity. So if there are two new concepts that's important today that you would want to remember, one is local activity. I have no time to go into the mathematical detail, but to give you an idea, what does local activity mean? Or, or the definition is any system is said to be locally active if and only if it is capable of amplifying infinitesimal fluctuations in energy. So it, it has to be able to amplify small energy. Not, not small voltage or small current or small velocity, but had to be energy. This is what has been missed by the uh, scientists. They didn't realize that you need to amplify energy. And in fact, there's a physical meaning of local tip cells. For example, one can use a locally active cell to amplify small signal at the expense of external power supply because you cannot get something for nothing. You have the power supply. For example, neurons in our brain maintain their local level of organization by burning glucose. We got to eat the sugar, etc. In fact, every living cell in our body is a molecular amplifier. They are all locally active. We would not be here if our cells are not locally active. And the principle that I'm introducing, which is the fundamental principle, is sim very simple. Complexity is impossible without local activity. And this principle has been proved, which I have no time to discuss. It divides all the, the universe of all cells into two classes. The left class is the class that obeys the second law of thermodynamics. They are called locally passive. 
everything else is locally active. Complexity, the cell has to be locally active. Okay? And as I already mentioned, the good news is that not only I have a definition, I have a way to test it. Simple analytical methods are available for testing whether a cell is locally passive or active. And so this is something that of the sophomore level that should be taught in future engineering or physics uh, curriculum. And the local activity principle, by the way, uh, has just been published by, in a book last two, two years ago by Professor Meinzer, a famous uh, mathematician, physicist, and a philosopher at the Technical University of Munich. He, uh, he, he, uh, he, well, my name is a co-author, but he wrote the entire book, and he just included my name because the book was entirely based on my uh, principle. But this, those of you who want to know, learn what is local activity principle, this is the book that you should study. It's, it's published, by the way, for those of you who want to know, it's published by the Imperial College Press from London. <coughs> Imperial College Press, 2013. Now, now that we know what local activity is and what is local, the local activity principle, we can now say that Boltzmann's frustrated search for a missing uh, principle of life against the struggle of entropy is exactly local activity. This is what he has been looking for. Schrodinger's hypothetical negative entropy, which he was, had been searching in vain, is precisely local activity. Prigogini's quest for an instability of the homogeneous is precisely local activity. So you can see that all of these things is under the same umbrella. Now this, so I have a definition and uh, how to test it. So we can now be quantitative. We can test things. And so we can get something more, even more precise. Now, but I will not be able to prove that. But the, but the basic proof comes from what I, my students now call trust reader. And this is very interesting, something you will always remember. So what is trust reader? Well, it's very simple. I'm going to come back to this later, so I'm presenting you what the reader is. I tell you I have a box, and I have only two elements inside. The two elements can be a series connection of an inductor, a capacitor, or a resistor, and they're linear. So it's very simple. But I tell you, I got a connection with two elements, and if I connect a battery, and for any initial time zero, when I put initial current, the solution is always an exponential. Something very familiar to all of you, especially in circuit in, in electric engineering. And I even have a formula. So this is something that should be very familiar. And then I say, let me add some dampings. Add a positive four ohm resistor. So our intuition, have, of course, has been if you add something that's more damping, add more friction, it's going to slow things down. Your car doesn't go so fast because of the friction. The friction always slows things down, makes things slower, etc. And yet, for this black box that you don't know yet, we have the property that if I put in this 4 ohm resistor to make it more damping, you, you might expect, your intuition might expect, of course, it would be just another exponential, only got to be slower. Well, the amazing thing is with the proper circuit element inside, you actually get not a stable thing, something that blows up. That is the, the reader. How can you add dissipation that tend to things more stable and yet becomes unstable to blow up? Now you can see the word unstable comes in. Remember the instability of homogeneous. This is, you can see the connection. And I have a, a, a poem, I mean, a, a verse say, the reader is tame when open, tame when shorted, explodes when dissipated. That's the reader. So, what is inside this back box? We are going to have return to this reader, and the solution of that is 
the main concept for today. That's why I'm introducing here. Now, before I do that, I want to introduce to you to three great unsolved problems from neurobiology. Many of you, because you did not know this, but there are three problems from famous people, Turing, that all of you know, the Turing machine. That he has a famous uh, paper in biology, actually, and I'm going to describe this briefly, and then smell, and then Hoskin Huxley. These are three problems that are still unsolved, so I will briefly describe to you, and then I will tell you the solution. Start with Turing. Turing was looking at something that you and I have gone through. It started with our mother's egg get fertilized, and then within a few days, the, the, the one cell, the fertilized cell become two cells, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and keep doubling. So in, within a two days, this cell forms a balloon, a ball. So this is called a blastula. All of us have gone through that stage. It is completely symmetrical. Turing is a mathematician, so he's looking for symmetry. To him, this is perfectly symmetrical because all the cells are identical. And if the cells are all identical, you expect the solution to be all homogeneous. And it's clearly homogeneous in a sphere, one of the most perfect symmetry. And yet, after about two days or so, is something happened, mysterious thing happened. It's like God suddenly come down and push his thumb and push it up, and then immediately after that, things happen. The, the ball becomes unstable and begins to deform, and you can see this is a cross-section. It begins to shape like that. This is a picture of a cross-section. This is the beginning of our, of our body, intestine, and guts, and etc., and this is what you and I came from. This process is called gastro... <coughs> I'm sorry. This is a process that has not un never been understood. And Turing said, how is that possible? How can a, 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 a ball with all identical cells suddenly deform? You know, uh, there's no God that pushing it, but just suddenly disappear. Well, of course, for a homogeneous media, which exhibit a non-homogeneous pattern when you become deformed, the homogeneous solution must become unstable. So Turing is a very perceptive mathematician. He said, I will try to prove that this is possible. So he said that, he's, let me just use two cells. He doesn't need to, the whole thing. He, he wants to show that it may be possible if you two, take two identical cells and have two, two chemical uh, concentration X1 and concentration Y1 for the cell on the left. Think of this as molecule, uh, the chemical one, chemical two. And he was very clever, but he, he had to do this by try and error. He had to pick the right numbers so that he can exhibit the behavior. One of the things we learned today is that with my new theory, I can pick this number in a few seconds. Turing had to do by this by try and error. So this is the first equation that he postulated. And this is identical, so he had a second identical equation, except for the subscript. And so you can see that the solution is when x1, y1, z, x2, y, all equal to 1, everything is 0. So it is the homogeneous solution as expected. These are two cells that are not interacting. Now Turing say he wants to make a diffusion, like the four coffee molecules. He wants to have diffusion, but he is going to use a different kind of diffusion, a diffusion that is dissipation. Namely, he said the first molecule is going to dissipate by 0.5 times the difference in the, in the concentration of X2 and X1. And likewise, the second molecule will diffuse with a diffusion rate of 0.4.5. Again, he was a genius to come up with this number because if you pick almost any number, you are not going to get this behavior. But he had, must have spent days trying by trial and error to come up with this number. My theory would find all this number within a minute. So this is now the equation. And this, this is an example of a reaction diffusion equation, which is a very general form of differential equation. So the first part is called the kinetic part. 
The second part is the Laplacian, the diffusion part. There is a very simple circuit interpretation of this equation. Namely, you have cells. For the present example, there are only two. But in general, you can have any number. They are identical. In the beginning, there's no coupling. And now, if you put a diffusion, the interpretation of that is resistors, positive resistors. So you can see the connection now. It is dumping. So you, you have the cells that are originally all identical and all are, are, are pretty dead. Nothing is moving. And you put in more dissipation. And what Turing wants to show is that it is possible, because of the right number he picked, to actually make this unstable. So let me show you his. So if you put this equation together, Turing's equation, this is the kinetic part, this is the diffusion part. You can see these are the four numbers, OK? And now, let me call this matrix G1, call this matrix G2, and call the sum capital G. And Turing, as I said, was very clever. He picked this number so that the, the first, when it's uncoupled, these are the kinetic part, all have negative eigenvalues. So this is stable. That's why all the cells are dead. You, you don't know what's going on. Nothing is interesting happening. And then he put in the diffusion part, whose eigenvalue is either zero or negative. So again, as expected, the diffusion being the resistor should make things slower. So, so you have two things that are both stable, and now you put them together. Uh, you, you can ask the mathematician here if there are any. Uh, most mathematicians would not even know, except for people like Turing, that, that it may be possible that this can be unstable if you know how to pick those numbers properly. And Turing did find this number, and I said he picked those numbers by try and error. I don't know how many days he planned to do that because it's non trivial. My theory will show that in one minute. But anyway, the point is, with this new matrix, the sum of two, he calculated the eigenvalue and showed that you have suddenly one eigenvalue that is positive. That's the responsible for something blowing up. So that is the main key result, that Turing contribution, a major result. Because before that, nobody would even think this is possible. But Turing, of course, didn't know he had to do this by trial and error. So he, he asked, what special property but must that matrix G1 possess to make destabilization possible? That's an unsolved problem. First unsolved problem. The second unsolved problem is by Smell, that many of you may know, a famous mathematician. He's, he continued Turing's experiment. Turing, uh, uh, example would lead to a static pattern. But Smell decided to change the two cells. He had two cells, but he made the cells more complicated. And he still used the same coupling. So that it slows things, it should slow things down. And yet, he was able to show that he can make this thing oscillate. So you now have a dynamic, like the, like the, the chemical, red, blue, red, blue. You can make it oscillate. Well, Smell does, again, he just showed that it's possible to make a dynamic pattern, to destabilize something that's stable. But he doesn't know why. So Smell ended up his paper published in, in 1976 or so. Smell asked, what axiomatic property must a reaction diffusion system possess to make Turing interacting system oscillate? Unsolved problem. That's an unsolved problem. And in fact, Smell was very pessimistic. In the end of this paper, he said, in 1974, he said, any sort of systematic understanding or analysis seems far away. And indeed, it's 74, and it, it's only a few years ago that I discovered this, the solution. So he was quite right that it was a non-trivial problem. The third unsolved problem is by Husky and Huxley, who oh, most of you know, discover how the neurons and, pop and, prop and how, how uh, the, uh, the axon, this is a neuron, can propagate under the right condition. Uh, so you have the Husky and Huxley cells with dumping. These are positive resistors that under the right condition, you can generate action potential. And this action potential is what 
where you and I came from, we would not be here if we cannot generate action potential. But the unsolved problem is, how is that possible? How can you something from zero, that stable, nothing, and then suddenly, when the right stimulus comes in, it jumps from minus 60 millivolt to 40. A hundred uh, nearly a gigantic jump. No one has known, has solved this problem. So these are the three unsolved problems up to, until recently. And I will tell you the answer. The solution to all three unsolved problems is the edge of chaos. That is the answer. And the edge of chaos turns out to be a special case of local activity. So I'm now getting into something much more fine in a very tiny region. And this is the main message for today's lecture. Local activity and a small subset of that that really is the gem. It's like a pearl in an oyster. It's called the edge of chaos. So what does edge of chaos mean? Edge of chaos means that an uncoupled cell, you pick a cell, Say, say a neuron or, or any, any cell, it's said to be on the edge of chaos if you have two conditions. One, it has to be locally active, but in addition, it has to be stable at the equilibrium point. So in other words, in the beginning, it, it's dead. You don't, you don't know that this, this cell is going to do something interesting until you put in some dumping. That's edge of chaos. I have proved a theorem which says that all of these three solutions is solved because of edge of chaos. And the theorem is, I call this edge of chaos theorem. It is very mathematical, something that would take a week to teach our students. But, and, and, but I'll give you the, 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 a feeling of why, of why it's so difficult, because it requires, the proof of this theorem requires non-trivial application of the following mathematical results. And it's, it's the result called Telegram's theorem, which is from circuit theory. For example, you need to know something about nonlinear and monotone operator in function space. You need to know something what's called, I call it high dimension analog of mean value theorem. Most of you know that mean value theorem has, is only good for scalar. There's no high dimension. But I, if you relax a, a small condition, there is an analog. So not exactly the old one, but that analog is what is needed. I have to derive that, of course. Then there is the Lazar's complete stability theorem for people in control system. You will know what that is. Then you need what's called Poisson integral theorem on half plane. You need to know the theory of positive real function on a complex variable. All of these are mathematics, but different branches of mathematics. But so most people would say, well, how come the mathematician would not have known about this before? And the reason is you need one more theorem telling us which is circuit theory. And mathematicians do not know circuit theory. So this is the reason why it took so long. Now, I will tell you, the, the proof is basically the answer to the Schwarz reader. Very complicated, but basically it is precisely to say what is got to be inside here, so that when you put in damping, originally everything's stable. So it's not interesting. Suddenly you put in dumping, then it becomes unstable. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because if you pick the inside, so the answer is this. It is just two elements. It's a resistor, but minus two ohm. Inductor minus two Henry. Normally, if you are circuit people, you know that if you have something with a minus resistance, things are going to be unstable. Or if you have a negative inductor, things will be unstable. But it turns out if you have both negative, they cancel out. This activity cancel out so that the thing becomes stable. That's, and if you derive the admittance, you will find that the pole is in the left half plane. So you, it's possible to have two unstable elements together to make something stable. This is the secret. And this is the secret of edge of chaos because edge of chaos say you have to be Stable. It is stable. Now, you, if you add damping, which normally you expect to be to make things more stable, but in this case, if I add 4 ohm resistor, in series with minus 2, it becomes plus 2. So now you end up with only one negative element. 
and this is why it's unstable. That is the reason. So this circuit is something every sophomore should learn. You should teach it to all students because it's so simple, but it is so fundamental. This is the edge of chaos. And the theorem that I proved that would take two weeks to prove, to, to, to study, is based exactly on this phenomena. Okay. And, I, and another good news is that testing for edge of chaos involves only linear algebra. So it's something that all sophomores can do. Okay, now let me move on to tell you uh, that because of this fundamental property, I can now summarize what we know. The principle of local activity pertains to open systems, where entropy is a non-monotonic function, which is what Boltzmann won, had to be negative, go negative. So it is the missing complementary principle of the second law of thermodynamics. So this principle of local activity, therefore I call this the fourth law of thermodynamics. Because that, that, there are three laws of thermodynamics. And roughly, for uh, uh, one way to think about that, uh, for today's talk, the first law of thermodynamics simply says there is no free lunch. Okay? The second law of thermodynamics simply says that complexity is impossible in closed systems. Entropy must increase. And there is a third law called, that's, it's called a Nernst theorem, that's called the third law of thermodynamics. So there are already three laws, and therefore the principle of local activity I propose to be the fourth law of thermodynamics. And this is something that is truly fundamental that all curriculum in the future, especially mechanics, should teach. Okay, now I'm going to conclude with a number of interesting uh, observations. First of all, local activity has to destabilize the homogeneous solution. And the reason this, the mechanism for that is as you, as you tune the parameter to make it locally active. You see, normally, like Turing, if you don't pick the number correctly, you are, end up with something not interesting, no local activity. Turing did it by trial and error. We now have a way to, to calculate those numbers. And when you tune this parameter, basically you are doing the following. In the beginning, you have a single minimum. As you tune, if you tune it correctly, like Turing finally did by trial and error, and which now, with my theory, will tell you how to tune, you are going to flatten this, eventually you're going to push, push it up, so that suddenly you have two minimum. So now you have two solutions. That is the, basically the principle where it came from. And the physical in understand physical interpretation that is actually using in many cases positive feedback. Positive feedback is a typical situation uh, mechanism that will give you local activity. A simple way to understand this is something all of you can do when you go home. This is a very old picture, so I'm using a very old television. But I have a camera now. You just use a, a high tech camera, and you look let the camera look at your television, and you let the output of the video camera become the input. Of that, so you are looking at what you see and keep going back feedback. You can try that with your video camera when you go home. And what you're going to see is all kinds of patterns. You can get that, for example, depending on the initial. None of this will ever repeat. This, the, the, so this is example of local activity that you can understand. And most of you, of course, know laser. Laser, how does it work? Well, you have active material, and you have to pump, give energy in. And you have to tune, in other words, the right parameter until it will become laser. Before you get to the right answer, if you do it by trial and error, all the atoms there are not uh, interacting properly, so every atom is doing his own, uh, own motion, so, th so, th so this, th there is no pattern here. And this corresponds to the case where the nonlinearity is either a straight line, but as you tune, it becomes steeper, and finally, it becomes an S shape. This is the same as this double uh, uh, valley. And suddenly, when you tune that, you have local activity, and all of the cells, when one is locally active, 
all the atoms will be synchronized. And many more examples are of the same phenomenon. In fact, the most recent one is Higgs, that all of you know, had, uh, the latest uh, Nobel Prize winner who discovered uh, Higgs boson, and that was this, uh, proved to be true only uh, last year. His theory essentially was to destabilize a potential, and this is Higgs potential energy. It, it, it is the symmetry breaking to get to minimum, and that's actually local activity. So it's a, called a stable Higgs sphere from symmetry breaking. That's come from local activity. The universe, with its expanding co complexity, emerged from the edge of chaos, where the initial quantum state was destabilized. The local activity principle is applicable also to non-physical systems. For example, I'm going to show you World Wide Web, economic system, or even social system. As you all know, the, all of our communication now is uh, wireless, and this is the World Wide Web. In this case, the positive feedback in the World Wide Web comes from the circular influences that web page authors and users have on one another, each taking actions that are influenced by the other. For example, a valuable, useful, or interesting web page tend to accumulate incoming links, and pages be can become more valuable by linking to other pages. And that's the source of the local activity. And there are more applications of local activity that apply to cosmology, psychology, sociology, and political science. In fact, you can stretch this. Now, this part, I have no equation of here. This is sociology, but the same principle can now be extended, I believe, but I have no proof. I call this extreme events, tsunami, earthquake, riots, stock market collapse, which appear perfectly calm. You see, all of this have the same phenomenon. Everything is, nothing is happening. You don't know there's going to earthquake, and then suddenly you have a big quake. You didn't have an action potential until something stimulated, and then you have a big quake. This appear perfectly calm until trigger must originate from the edge of chaos. Because that's what the edge of chaos say. It has to be first stable, nothing exciting, and then suddenly something boom, okay? Something big. The stock market collapse is suddenly an example of local activity uh, economy. Riots demonstration are triggered by locally active interactions. And I will quickly give you a few more motivating examples. Remember, I started by saying, complexity always starts with something very simple. So simple that you don't think anything interesting will happen, but you put them together, and with the right number or right parameter to make it locally active, in the edge of chaos, suddenly, boom. How about ants? All of you, of course, know ants, but you may not realize that ants actually are quite stupid. Individual ants. And to show you why I say that, no one has succeeded in teaching individual ants to do anything, for example. And here's an example. You starve an ant, so the arm is really, you know, uh, has no food for days. Then suddenly you put the ant in a labyrinth, and you put sugar, always on the right. Whenever you have a branch, you always put this ant. You always put the right branch whenever you have bifurcation. So you would think that an ant would quickly learn to get the, the sugar, and yet, no matter how you teach the ant, it will always make mistake. So you can never teach an ant. And the ant, however, is a social animal. If you put, say, 20 of them together, ants are lazy, so, so they try to roam, roam around, and suddenly they want to take a, take a rest. But they all take a rest at different times. So if you have only 20 of them, and you plot the number of ants at any time, say up to 500 minutes, you see that they, there's no regularity, okay? This is just like the coffee molecule in the beginning, that, you know, that to dissipate, uh, to, to, to diffuse. You increase the number to, from 20 to 10 ants to 20 ants, still not much interesting thing happen. Increase it to about 40, still nothing, you know, there's no pattern. No pattern. And then, but by the time you get to 80, if you apply my theory, it will tell you to calculate, it will tell you you need to be at least 80 ants, and then suddenly it becomes periodic of 25 
minutes. So all of a sudden, as the number of ants exceeded some threshold, which is 80 in this case, they decided all to take a coffee break simultaneously every 25 minutes. That means that the ants has become locally active. And this is an example of application of local activity. I have two more quick examples. That is now even more fascinating, I believe. And this is due to Bertrand Russell that I believe all of you know. And let's imagine that uh, you go to a village, and I was just <coughs> asking Jacobo earlier, what's the small village? And he said, how about uh, Mombello, Monferrato? It has only 500 people. So that village has only one barber, it was so small. So let's go to that village. And that, this is Bertrand Russell's example, okay? So he said, let's go to this tiny village. And this barber has only one barber in the village. It's very peculiar. He is willing to shape only those that don't shape themselves. So he has a, even a rule. I shape only men who don't shape themselves. The question is, this, there is a paradox. Okay, remember this rule. He doesn't shape anybody that sh say he shaped himself. Well, the question is, who shaped the barber? Well, think about it. If the barber does not shape himself, then the barber has to shape himself, right? Because, because he will shape anybody that does not shape himself. So therefore, if he shaped himself, the barber shaped himself, then the rules, his rules say, the barber does not shape himself. You see that? There's, there's a, this paradox, contradiction. You may think this is just a funny joke, but this is very deep. In fact, this is why it's called the barber paradox, proposed by Bertrand Russell. And this is what an example of self-reference, which is an example, par excellence, of positive feedback. The barber's self-referential dynamic is positive feedback resulting from local activity. And within the framework of classical logic, the barber paradox is undecidable, which means this very important concept here, a deep concept from Bertrand Russell. Something can be undecidable. By showing that a paradoxical statement, the barber's paradox, that some paradoxical term could appear in ordinary language and logic, Bertrand Russell has shown that the standard method of logical inference are too weak to resolve inborn simple questions. In other words, he was saying that there are fundamental truths that cannot be proved, even though you all believe that it's true. The barber's local interaction in Bertrand Russell is in fact locally active in my interpretation. And now the ultimate application of this barber's paradox is Gerder, Kurt Gerder. Gerder all, most of you, I'm sure, know him. In 1931, had published a, a, a shocking paper, a classic, and he's considered remaining probably the smartest man alive, I mean, ever lived. He's, he proved, proved in 1931 that there are mathematical proportions that can be seen to be true, but cannot be proved to be true. And this, his proof, this is called the famous Gerders, incompleteness theorem. It is probably one of the deepest theorems there is in mathematics. And yet, what is the connection with local activity? Well, the connection is the local good incompleteness theorem is mathematically equivalent to Bertrand Russell's Barber's Paradox. That's, it, that's exactly how, uh, how Gerder proved. It's not trivial proof, of course, but he was using the Bert, Gerber, uh, Bertrand Russell's Barber's Paradox to prove this deep theorem. And since I just interpreted Bar the, the Barber's Paradox as a form of local activity, we can say, therefore, the local activity is the origin of Gerdes' incompleteness theorem. Now, the, let me give you one simple example of what, why, what something that you think is true but can never be proved. For example, all of you would agree intuitively that every even number is the sum of two prime numbers. I mean, it's just, it's just, there's no, no, it's completely obvious. But try to prove it. No one has been able to prove it. So people have tried to say maybe it's wrong, they put it in a computer, 
the last count that I have found is that this is called a gold bar conjecture. Up to 400 trillion, it's still people are still trying to compute and still it was true, it was always true, but nobody can prove it. And the reason is God is incomplete theorem, which is an example of something that seemed to be true but can never be proved to be true. I will end my talk with a cocktail again. You have seen cocktail, daiquiri, you know, or area that you mix two liquid and uh, uh, alcohol with, with some lemon juice, whatever, you get eventually the same color. But what if you pick Tia Maria? And my students love this because uh, it is a very nice cocktail. So, they, so they, they do it in the lab. They love to do it. I provided a Tia Maria. And what you do is you pour Tia Maria on a glass, wine glass, and then you put about one centimeter of milk, ordinary milk, from the refrigerator. About one centimeter. And because from your experience we have seen earlier, you would expect eventually everything would become white. But not in Tia Maria. In about five minutes, you begin to see this spaghetti-like thing. And so this is an example of a cocktail that uh, is not homogeneous. And how can that be possible? What makes Tia Maria cream possible? And of course now you know the answer. It's local activity generated by chemical reaction. And this is a fun cocktail that, that uh, I would invite you to, to try. So the final two slides I want to show you is to tell you the significance. Remember, I have local activity, the two concepts. We have the principle of local activity, which is I call now the fourth law of thermodynamics because it is the complement of the second law. Actually, it should have been called a third law, but unfortunately there is a third law already because it is, it is exactly what the entropy is not in the second law. It is that entropy can, can, can decrease, okay? Now, edge of chaos is a, is a tiny part of the locality. Remember, the goal here is to, you have a system that suddenly becomes interesting and you want to find out, or, or you want to find out how to manipulate the parameter until you get something interesting. Edge of chaos, shows you where to find a needle in the, in the haystack. So imagine you, have, imagine you have a haystack, which is, unfortunately is not so clear, but these are the haystacks. And somewhere in the haystack, there are one, two, three, you know, 20 haystacks. One of them has a needle. And if you don't have a theory and you want to find the haystack, of course, what do you do? You've got to find every one of them until you find, find it, right? The local activity test it says it tells you, you don't have to try all haystack. You've got to go to only one. So, so the local activity tells you where not to go. Where not, the local activity tells you where not to look. But once you have one haystack, but, but the needle is still somewhere. You're still you know, a big haystack. The edge of chaos tells you where to zoom in to get. That is basically the power of this uh, principle. And my last slide, of course, is another cartoon. Earlier, we started with a cappuccino, and, and everybody is behaving the same way. No complexity. Now I have the same cappuccino, but I dope it with LSD. And now you have local activity. You now see that the student here, one of them is raising the left hand, now this is double hand, and this one even has a fit on there, they are different. They are patterned. That is local activity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.